Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckheads join me shortly in our topics this week. Justice returns to the mayor's race. Election returns should show a big turnout. And big money is turning out for a Johnson County Democrat, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and continue our discussion about the seven proposed changes to the Jackson County Charter on the ballot this November. We talked last week with former County Executive Catherine Shields. This week, one of the architects of the plan joins us, Legislator Greg Grounds from Blue Springs, who is not running for re-election. Mr. Grounds, welcome to Ruckus. Thank you, Mac. I'm glad to be here. Why are you not running for re-election? Well, partly uh, personal reasons. I've been in office between this and the mayor's office in Blue Springs 27 years. Uh, but mostly because I've reached a frustration level with uh, county government and some of the chaos that's been present in the last two years. Is that why you worked on the seven proposed changes? It was the genesis that made me realize that some of the solutions to the disputes we have could be resolved by charter changes. Do you think you're getting a high level of support for the changes? Every group I talk to, people are nodding their heads yes on issues like ethics reform and term limits. Uh, they seem to understand they're supportive of transfer of the jail to the sheriff's department and the combat to the prosecutor. So I would say that the personal response I'm getting is quite large. Uh, you mentioned some of the elements in the changes. Can you do a quick overview of what they include? Yes. Uh, there are principally four major areas. Uh, those are term limits ethics uh, that for the first time appear in the charter, transfer of the jail to the sheriff's department, and combat to the prosecutor's office. I also address what I think are needed salary increases so that all people who are elected, uh, all people in the county are available are able to run for office without having to suffer a uh, financial burden by leaving their present jobs. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Catherine Shields was on last week and I re-watched the interview and I think I can give you a quick overview of what she said, and you said you had seen it as well. She says county government doesn't need restructuring, that this is essentially a power grab and salary increases disguised as term limits. She's unhappy with the way the term limits measure is written, says it leaves loopholes, and she doesn't agree with the idea of prohibiting anyone who holds a local, state, or federal office from running for a county office. How do you respond? Well, there are two aspects to the major thrust of the charter. The first is to address getting more and more people involved in eliminating the power of incumbency. Right now, if somebody runs for an office countywide, they have to address over 600,000 potential uh, residents, and people aren't interested in funding these kind of offices in terms of campaign donations. So the incumbency is more powerful here than it is in any other office. We also address some problems, and that's the second side, that continue to come up, like the jail, the combat tax, how those funds are spent. So the intent was to both address what we see are long-term problems with incumbency and short-term ones that haven't been addressed in the last two years. Well, the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce is opposing all of the changes and saying the reason is there was no public input. Was there no public input? The, I'm disappointed in the chamber. They invited me to speak and then they disinvited me. <laughs> the last uh, charter commission, which is what they would like to see, met for a total of 55 days, had two public hearings. The county legislature has looked at this for over 210 days, two public hearings, and a number of other unaddressed public hearings where people came and wanted to address us. It's been on TV, radio, the newspapers, I just think uh, that there's some politics involved over there. Otherwise, they would have spoken to me and got our view before they took a position. Uh, one of the things that would happen as a result of these charter changes is that the power of the county executive would be lessened. Is that on purpose because of Frank White? It's not on purpose because of Frank, but it was highlighted by some of the disputes we've presently had. What some of us believe are misapplication of the combat funds that went to fund some salary positions that weren't included in the budget. 
uh, purchase of a vehicle that wasn't part of the budget, where the voters who voted for the combat tax anticipated it would go to fight drugs exactly as anticipated. So we saw the need to make sure that it was placed in a prosecutor's office where we thought it would be more capably managed. So some of the county executives' actions have precipitated these changes, but when I drafted this, I realized I wasn't addressing just one county executive, but into the future. So the intent in some of the provisions, like the appointment of a municipal judge, was to take politics out of the system. And how about you, running for anything else? Never again. You were the mayor of Blue Springs at one time. I had that on privilege the city council, for I think. quite a few years. Yes. And how long were you on the county commission? Uh, uh, the legislature. legislature. This, is, this is my 12th year. 12th year. All right, good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Always good to see you. That is Jackson County Legislator Greg Grounds. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Patrick Tuohy is Director of Municipal Policy at the Show Me Institute, a free market think tank. Terry Riley is a former councilman and now the head of Transformation Consultants. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Well, we begin with the story of justice delayed but not denied. Jolie Justice, the 4th District Councilwoman, has rejoined the race for Kansas City Mayor next spring. Justice dropped out when Jason Kander dropped in, saying they represented the same constituencies and pulled from the same donors. Now that Kander has gotten out, Justice is back in. So, Terry, does she again become the front runner in the campaign? I guess that will be up to the public, but before she got out, she was the, uh, the front runner. Uh, many people are saying now Quentin Lucas is possibly uh, the front runner. But uh, it's a long campaign season. Uh, Jolie is a very formidable candidate, and she has access to raising a lot of money. And so, therefore, um, she gets back in with money, with resources, and as I said earlier, one would have to see what the public says. Well, you know the territory. You've been there yourself. Or you surveyed all the candidates who are running. What's your impression? Is she most popular at this point? Uh, she, she is one that could raise a lot of money, and she is a former state senator, and she has, uh, and, and one of the, the, the four parts of the stool, she has one already, which is that corridor, the Southwest Corridor, which is a huge voting block. And so if she's able to get that voting block to Southwest Corridor, uh, urban community, east of Truce, and or north of the river of South Kansas City, you need those elements to win. Mary, well, yeah. who do you, Mary, who do you see emerging as a strong candidate? I think she just emerged. Uh, she, Jolie is uh, quite a character. I mean, she has a wonderful personality. But, but beyond Jolie, who else is likely oh, to get well, a lot of attention? Oh, well, the question now is, and I haven't heard anything today, but whether Cindy Serco uh, we'll get into the race, and that will juggle things. A Former bit. councilwoman, former and councilwoman, mayor and Eastern Jack, mm -hmm. and boy, does she have a lineage in the <laughs> Woody, What should they be politics. talking about as they campaign for mayor of Kansas City? Uh, I know taxes and the cost of running city government would be something you'd suggest. Yeah, we have gone from being a low tax city to being a pretty high tax city, and. Uh, the, You'll wait a long time to read about that in the Kansas City Star. So one of the questions, the two things that kind of I noticed, are, number one, is anybody in this race going to talk about the city's financial condition, mm -hmm. the mountain of debt we have? We're now in a rising interest rate uh, economy. Uh, we've been borrowing money, dirt cheap. Nobody's going to be doing that very soon. And, and for the next 20 years, we're committed every year to borrow a bunch of money at what appear to be rising interest rates. Is somebody going to have a plan to, to recapture our credit rating? Uh, the second thing is I wonder about the airport. Mm -hmm. Is it going to carry... And Jolie? that's a Jolie Justice issue. Exactly. Is that going to carry her into office on, you know, the wings of eagles? Or is the soaring price tag on it, which has already gone up like 50% since the voters said okay to it, is that going to be the albatross around her neck? I don't know whether that's going to help her or and, hurt her. And there continue to be delays and changes <clears throat> and problems that weren't anticipated. And price increase. Saw you on television. Some people, some I saw you. Anticipated I saw you on television right. uh, <laughs> earlier this week on 41 Action News, and you were talking about the homicide rate and 
how disgusting it is that nothing is being done about it. Someone needs to talk about it. And, and uh, I think Woody is exactly right. Uh, Kansas City uh, is poorly run. We have uh, an awful lot of, we have a high tax, we have high debt, uh, we can't deliver basic services. We have a homicide rate that is fifth, fifth in the country. And we have political leadership that is unwilling to higher do anything. Higher than Chicago, anything. right? Absolutely higher than Chicago. We're, we're behind only four other cities, Detroit, St. Louis, Cincinnati. Uh, and nobody is talking about it. It is just short of criminal. We, if we can't provide public safety, then who cares about convention hotels and airports and streetcars? And, and the mayor, whomever the mayor is, serves on the police board. Serves on the police board and controls the city budget, including the police budget. Yeah. Well, well maybe a, we ought to stop. Uh, start with uh, giving Kansas City control. That's over a red herring. It's Absol not a red herring. It absolutely it's is a, a red herring. It's a very important issue, and it ought it, to be fixed. Where the only city change. in the nothing country, nothing would change. It, the only city in the country that doesn't control its own police force. And, but, and the people who want to control it won't even talk about the homicide rate. So we should turn well, it over mayor, to them. James the, has talked about it. He talked you, about it. Do something about it. The legislature has tied his do hands some, on no, guns. No, no. It, and, guns, and, aren't and, a, guns don't make a difference, Mary. No. Guns don't make oh, a difference. No, no, we have the same, no, no, no. Boy, we have the same, new, we have the same ownership rate of guns in Jackson County, Missouri, as we have in Johnson County, Kansas. They do not have a homicide problem. It is not the number of guns. We have an economic deprivation coupled with other issues, problems. Uh, uh, let me say this. When Cleaver in, uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s brought the community police in here where police actually knew people in the community, coupled with us trying to do some more creative things as it relates to education in this city, I believe that the corporate community in this city should go and adopt a high school everywhere in this city, start pulling people up out of poverty, because if you live in perpetual poverty, it will lend itself to you not being successful economically. How do I know this? Maybe because I have a picture in my phone and I show my kids every day. This is where I grew up at. This is where we are now by working hard and people working with me and helping lift me up along with other people in this community, we can well, change Well, I think this. we have if, clearly if exhausted, totally of, we've exhausted uh, this yeah, topic. Homicide's and, out of control uh, in this city, on. and I think you're 100% correct. The number of registered voters in both Jackson and Johnson counties suggests the turnout on November the 6th will turn out to be one of the largest, if not the largest, in history. As the registration ended in Johnson County, the number of registered voters hit just over 416,000. The largest block is still Republican, followed by independents and then by Democrats. Of course, registration numbers don't guarantee the outcome. Still, there seems to be intense interest this year. So what is so different about 2018, Patrick? Really? What is so different about 2018? That's your question? That was, that was the question. What is so uh, different about 2018? So, I, I, so part of it is, of course, people are excited because of the president, because of what's been going on in Congress. But, but on reflection, I thought, I wonder if, if this is kind of a harbinger of bad things, because perhaps what it tells us is that politicians are less inclined to try to communicate with people that don't already agree with them and rather just say, well, let's get the people that already agree with me and just get them out to vote. So you're motivating the base. I don't think that solves our long-term problem of democracy and discourse, but it says, you know, we've got to get bodies out to the polls. Aren't there interesting races that are causing people to take a hard look at this year's election? Oh, you bet. And, you know, Tip O'Neill did have some wisdom there with all politics is local. Uh, Claire and Holly, of course. You know, Which is the debate that was on just before <laughs> oh, Rutgers and, this evening. You know, the, the, the race here, you know, the way in which Trump has tried to nationalize certain issues has certainly had a, an effect. The Me Too movement that women have responded to so strongly across the nation, of course, is affecting things. But absolutely, I mean, the race for Congress on the Kansas side, Sharice Davis and Yoder, I mean, is, is, is a pretty big deal. Even Watkins and Davis is a major race now. Second district and of Kansas. the governor's race in Kansas is just extraordinarily important. Everybody understands it's a, it's a, it's one of the biggest we've well, ever had. Uh, we had Steve Rose on the pro uh, program last week, and I talked at some length with him about his feelings toward the Republican Party. As you know, he's written columns saying he can't vote for That's Kevin right. Yoder and he can't vote for Chris Kobach. 
and he has consulted with uh, former Governor Bill Graves and no, former and hell Senator no, I think he <laughs> uh, former Senator Nancy Landon Kassebob. I know you follow Steve's writings closely, Patrick. Uh, you looked at the column. What's your assessment? I look. Uh, uh, a Republican Party or a Democratic Party is not an ideology, it's not a system of views, it's a club, it's a party. If you don't vote for that party, you can't be said to be a member of it. Now he may say I'm still a conservative, but I'm not a Republican, that's defensible. But you can't say you're a tennis player and never actually play tennis. So I think Steve is trying to have it both ways. You want to be an independent thinker, you want to vote for Democrats, you're welcome to do that, don't say it. He says he's discussed all this with Bill Graves and with uh, Nancy Kassebaum. And he can't vote for Kevin Yoder in the 3rd District. He may not vote for Sharice Davids, can't vote for Kevin Yoder. And yet, I was looking through some news sites a couple of days ago, and on Tony's Kansas City, there was a news release about leading moderates in Kansas who have come out in support of Kevin Yoder. At the top of the list is none other than former Governor Bill Graves. So I don't know well, what Bill, that does Bill to, to said, Rose's argument. But. Mike, that, he, that he'd never uh, sup in, publicly endorsed a Democrat before in his life, before he endorsed Laura Kelly. And, you know, he, <laughs> that, that's just a, a strange comment coming from up to my ride over here. If we right. only have two what, parties. What was in a the, strange comment coming from your Here's the strange right. thing. Parties, if one can't what be was the independent. Strange thing? What, what, you if said one can't vote for an occasional Republican or an occasional Democrat and call yourself a member of your favorite party, you know, that's well, just a kind of... Not, but, but voting for ridiculous. someone is a little bit different than writing a newspaper column telling people they shouldn't well, vote Steve for someone. Well, Steve has been prognosticating for how many years now, and that's his job in life. He writes for the Star. He's almost but got it right. Bill Graves has always been a moderate, and these people see Kobach. For exactly what Chris Kobach, Kobach is. is an extremist. He is an extremist, and they don't well, like it. They like their moderate well, Kansas party. What is extreme about uh, He's oh a, Chris goodness. Kobach? Kobach is a voter. Uh, he is the commander in chief of voter suppression. He goes around the country and tries to suppress the vote so that people cannot exercise their right as an American citizen. He is a vote. All right, let's so get a rebuttal state, from him. What Woody. state of this union? He's do a white voter people, well, Do white people outvote blacks by the widest margin? What do you think it is? It's Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. I don't think they're listening to Chris Kobach in Massachusetts. You know, five of, that, that's, that, of the states of the old That's not an accurate depiction there of are, what we're talking about. There are here. 11 states in the old confederacy. Five, in five of them, African Americans voted higher rates than white people do. That's half of the old South. That sounds good. And that's, that's a, where that, they listen to Chris Kobach. Okay. But somehow that, black people managed to okay. vote. That's, a, th 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 that's great. But the same yeah, model is being facts. used. It, it's unfactual. You talk about those things that really doesn't get, when the numbers are thin, that's when they come in like they're doing in Georgia and try to Here, here Here's another the fact. Here's, 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 hey, here's another fact. Hey, here's uh, another fact. Time is up for the second. Unfactual. <laughs> uh, there are some skeptics who will claim that hypocrisy exists in our political campaigns. For example, oh, no. the Star <laughs> recently <laughs> ran a story about Kansas 3rd District Democratic candidate Sharice Davis <clears throat> conducting letter writing campaigns and hosting panel discussions decrying the corrosive role of money and special interest in campaigns. Especially however, however, Davids has raised nearly $3 million, roughly twice the amount of her rival, incumbent Republican Kevin Yoder. Certainly some of that money must have come from special interest. So let's talk about political campaigns. Mary, you've been involved with your own some years ago and others in the meantime. Can campaigns succeed? Can they exist without money and special no, interests? You've got to pay for things. And not in this country. They don't. We don't have public financing and probably never will. And so we have this concocted system that nobody understands. Most voters don't understand. And we, we accept pretty much right now that, you know, whatever goes in the Supreme Court allows dark money to flourish all over the country. However, let's talk about this issue. Dick Bowling, who used to be the congressman from Kansas City, was the great, within Congress, a, a, a creator of a thought process that we need to get control over how much money and uh, from whom uh, uh, the, the funds come to run our campaigns. And what Sharice is talking about is how are we going to get 
full transparency about where the money comes from, how the, the voters come to understand where it comes from. Now, a great way to go about it for starters is clean Missouri in Listen, the state of Missouri. McCain-Feingold <laughs> put us in the problem we're in now. Right. First of all, we've been talking about factionalism and special interests since Federalist Number Ten before the the, the country was uh, created. And as they're it not is all now. bad, are they? No. Yeah. And, and his whole point was they balance each other. But McCain-Feingold in 2002 was this effort to try to create or, or limit the amount of money in politics. And what did it do? It created the system we have now. What we need is transparency rather than trying to stop need, money. Need to go to Woody here. Uh, You've spent a lot of time in political campaigns. You didn't run yourself, but you've been involved as the GOP chairman in Not Missouri. Silly enough to do you've that. You've been around the bunch of them. Uh, simply speaking, you can't have a campaign without money and without special interest to help fund campaigns. No. And, and the Supreme Court does not allow dark money. The Constitution does. And they, they have to trample on the Constitution. They want to abolish it. Is that under the heading of free speech? But, you know, I, I, yes, money, yeah. look, if you want to speak, you have to have the money, money to exactly. make yourself yeah. heard. So if you don't have the money, you're not really speaking to anybody but the folks on your block. Uh, she is being supported by a lot of dark money. Uh, that money comes largely from George Soros. How does he make his money? Manipulating currency. Who can help him manipulate currency? The people in Washington. He has an interest in That's her being true. elected. But, 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 and who gets hurt when <laughs> currencies get manipulated? Working people, yeah. poor people, but, people on fixed incomes. Just so we know, dark money is money that is contributed and you don't have to disclose That's who the right. donor was. That's, That's right. right. Corporations, when to the, the Supreme Court they, said yeah. that corporations are people, and that they must not and be deprived of their, right, of their rights to uh, raise as much and give as much. And the example in Missouri is there's not any lid on how much they can pour into your pockets. And we have people writing checks for million dollars like your boss, or I don't know, he still is your boss, Woody. But not my uh, so boss, what? He's my client. You have to purchase <laughs> you have, your client a million yeah, dollars a crack. It'll, it works really well. Worked out well for Woody. Well, look at that. <laughs> uh, uh, no, Terry. Let's uh, talk after the show. So has special, he elected special, the governor? A special interest. An in, can we conclude this conversation over here? Uh, <laughs> a special interest can be an individual, can it not? I mean, don't we all have special interest in campaigns and in candidates? I, well, there's a fundamental difference between individuals and then you have the PACs and all that. I, I mean, it, it's here. We have to deal with it. And so... Uh, when individuals in Missouri, Missouri is unique uh, when you can just donate a million here, a million there. I mean, it, it really impacts the campaigns and it stops a lot of people that could possibly get, be good candidates to actually do something to balance the budget in Missouri, balance the budget in Congress. But the interests of those individuals, uh, they are, they heavily influence the race when you have a million dollars to throw around like... Sure, and that's by design. What you yeah. do is you, you say we're going to have a democracy, we're going to mm -hmm. encourage people mm -hmm. to counterbalance each other's factions, so you've got, I, I don't know, the, the Koch brothers on one side, you've got George Soros on the other. This is working fine. The problem yeah. is what no, happens is, oh, what happens is, plethora of people over here. Uh, and, yeah, right. and, what, and you want to use the power of government yeah. to shut gotta, people up. Gotta, I don't want to use Speaking of shutting, shutting people, people up, <laughs> I guess we'll have to do that, so <laughs> we have to head now for the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Rock Heads have 30 seconds each to theorize, analyze, or compromise, and we start with Mary. Well, I, I have to p pay tribute during this, this season to the uh, people who have stood up to Trump within the Republican Party. When Senator Pat Roberts said of Claire McCaskill, if you want to get somebody who will get the job done in a bipartisan way in the United States Senate, Go choose Claire McCaskill. Good for him. I mean, that's what we need. We cannot have a functioning democracy run by tribal partisan politics. The people that are standing up for Laura Kelly in Kansas, not just Steve Rose, but Nancy Kassebaum, Dick Bond, and John Vrattle, and all kinds of people, uh, Sandy Prager, former state insurance commissioner, they are standing up to Trump and Kobach and doing so with, with real class All right, from Terry. that perspective. Uh, I'm going to roast Josh Hawley today because he actually filed a lawsuit because I got concerned and I said, well, maybe that commercial 
you know, that, that maybe what he said about people, you know, talking about his kid is an issue, in which it is. No one should ever say anything about it. You're talking it. about pre existing conditions. Yeah, pre existing conditions. But the lawsuit is filed in court. He filed a lawsuit against people with pre existing conditions. And so I thought it was just campaign, just mumble jumble, but it was factual. And so I'm roasting him today. All right, Woody. Uh, I'd like to give a toast to Jay Sexton, professor at the University of Missouri, kind of a rock star down there, and at Oxford, where he taught for 16 years. And he has written a new book, A Nation Forged by Crisis. And since it looks like we're headed for one, oh, <laughs> it might be a, a book worth reading. It really does have a new perspective in how America got to be what it is today, and it is well worth your time. Patrick. Uh, my toast is for KSHB News, and specifically Dia Wall and Andy Al Alcock for keeping a focus on homicide in Kansas City when our political leaders will not. And finally, here is a toast to letter writer Carl LaSala of Leewood, whose letter to the star asked two questions. Number one, is there a single Democratic candidate the editorial board does not love? And two, is there a single Republican candidate that it does? Carl certainly knows the answer to both is no. And now with the power vested in me as the ruckus host, and because of his insightful letter, I hereby proclaim Carl LaSala an honorary ruckette. This must be a proud time for Carl. And that is Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night. Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Barbara and Peter Gattermeyer, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you.